This is TTT Live. I'm DK Rostar. The Ministry of Health is giving an update on the status of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. We are bringing you live coverage on TTT, Chalk City 91.1 FM, Sweet 100.1 FM, Next 99.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. Now over to the Minister of Communications, Donna Cox. Good morning and welcome to today's virtual media conference to apprise you of government's efforts to combat COVID-19. Today with me are the Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, Dr. Mark West, consultant, cardiothoracic surgeon at Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex, and Dr. Narish Nandram, Principal Medical Officer, Epidemiology at the Ministry of Health. The Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, will provide an update on COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, Minister Cox. Good morning to members, ladies and gentlemen of the media and all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, wherever you are this morning. So a quick update on the global situation. We haven't done this in a while. Uh, the world, unfortunately, has reached another grim milestone. We have reached the three millionth case. It seems just like yesterday, we were talking about the millionth case, the 1.5 and the two. Here we are today on Tuesday 28th, 3,085,128 cases. That's globally 212,526. Of the 3 million cases, those who have recovered are 934,807. What is our local situation? Total number of tests done to date, 1,582. Total number of unique patient tests, 1,290. Total number of repeated tests, 292. Total number of positive cases, 116. Total number of discharges to date, 59. So about 50% roughly, a little, a little more. Total number of deaths, eight, seven in Trinidad, one in Tobago. Total number of new patients, uh, none so far. Tobago, we have no patients being treated at present, which is good. Total number of hospitalized patients, nine. All nine are in Coover. We have no one at Cora at this point in time. Of those nine persons at Coover, no one is on ventilation. No one is on the ICU system. No one is in an HDU uh, ward. Um, those nine people continue to be uh, basically ambulatory. They could walk around. I understand one patient has some pre-existing conditions that we are managing uh, very carefully. At the Sangre Grande Center, Brooklyn, we have gotten that population down from 28 to 8, so there are 8 persons there. Home of football in Coover, 32. Between both facilities, they are asymptomatic, low risk, and stable. At the Takarigua site, I think that number continues to be 33. Yes, 33. They are under quarantine, and um, they, they are all doing well. We have started to use a NAPA facility. You may remember the NAPA facility was dedicated to healthcare workers as they uh, complete their, and I use the word tour of duty loosely. Uh, we now have four persons, four healthcare workers in the NAPA facility. Um, so they will serve out their um, uh, period there. And we expect 12 more to go in there next week. We have to take care of our healthcare workers there. So that is the update today. Before I hand over to Minister Cox, I just want to note one area of concern that I saw in one of the newspapers this morning. And this is where, if as a society, we all don't pull together, uh, COVID-19 could overtake us. There is a photograph on one of the newspapers of someone getting a haircut on the Brian Lara promenade. The barber is wearing a mask, but the customer has no mask on. And close physical contact 
is determined by being close to somebody for 15 minutes or more. What I saw in the newspaper this morning disturbed me greatly. Everyone, as far as possible, should be wearing a mask. You can make your own mask at home, as I have done from an old t-shirt. It doesn't cost you anything much, but it can save your life. The lesson to be learned from that photograph is that we need to have all persons in society pulling together. Pulling together in one direction. And if we do that, we will limit the spread of COVID-19. So I just used that photograph as a launching point this morning to again appeal, appeal to persons to be careful, stay home, but also protect yourself by wearing a mask. Thank you very much, Minister Cox. Thank you very much, Minister. At this time, Dr. Mark West, consultant, cardiothoracic surgeon at Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex, will speak on chest surgical manifestations of COVID-19. Dr. West. Good morning. Thank you very much, Minister Cox, Minister Dial Singh, Dr. Nandra. Good morning to the media and members of the public. As mentioned, I am a consultant cardiothoracic surgeon at the Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex, NCRHA, and I am a part of a team. I emphasize team uh, comprising other thoracic surgeons, uh, Dr. Ian Ramnarain, Dr. Sagubadi, Dr. Ivan Gamboa. And there are other teams as well who have participated in the management and treatment of our patients. We have anesthetists, physicians, nurses, workers, cleaners, cooks. It is a massive united effort. Today, I would like to discuss a particular case that has well, we managed at Cuba. Um, I will be showing some pictures. These pictures will be representative of the case. They will not be the actual case for confidentiality reasons. I want to show this case to remind people just how serious a disease this really is, and also to echo what the minister has said. We want to try and prevent any further cases, particularly as, they, as a run-up to potentially relaxing some of the stay-at-home orders. We do not want to see any further increases in the cases, if possible at all, because this may affect our ability to open the country. So we must be vigilant and we must not be complacent. Now, the first slide, please. So the first case involves an elderly male. He was a non-smoker. Um, he had a productive cough of green phlegm. He was short of breath and he was fatigued. He had no travel history and he had been in contact with a patient who tested positive from one of the ships. He had risk factors, there were hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease. He initially presented to a Rima hospital for which he was transferred to Eric Williams where he was tested and found to be positive. Given the severity of his symptoms at the time, he was then transferred to Kuva facility. There, his shortness of breath became worse he developed what was called pneumothoraces. I will show clearly the picture there. Bilateral pneumothoraces of both sides. And his oxygen requirement increased. He was transferred to the high dependency unit or HDU. And bilateral chest drains were inserted. So a lot of steps were taken to improve this man's ventilation. If you're looking at the x-rays on the screen, the one to my left is normal. You can see the ribs, you can see the white structure, which is the heart. On both sides, you can see darkened areas with some white lines. These are the lungs. These lungs are fully inflated. These are, this is normal. The lower white structure is the diaphragm and stomach. We're focusing on the chest. On the other side, the x-ray is very abnormal. It shows what we call a pneumothorax, or in simple terms, a lung collapse. We can see the heart, as before. It has been moved aside. We can see on the other side, that's the patient's left, the normal lung markings. But on the other side, which is the patient's right, 
you can see it is very dark. And the lung markings do not come up all the way to the chest wall. This is called a pneumothorax. It is caused when air escapes outside the lung into the chest cavity, but does not get out fully. Now, next slide, please. This gentleman, however, had a further complication of pneumothoraces. First of all, he had both sides had a pneumothorax, but the air then started to leak outside the chest wall, but under his skin, so that the air tracked up outside the chest wall, up into his face. The picture is that somewhat of a blown up individual or Michelin man appearance. On the other side, you can see what treatment was provided. He had what we call chest drains or intercostal drains. These are plastic tubes placed by intensivists or chest surgeons to relieve the air that is coming out from the lungs. They come out through these tubes and into a valve system that allows it to drain. When he had this done, his oxygen requirements settled down, his distress decreased, and overall he clinically improved. He clearly was going the wrong way and was on the way to requiring ventilation, which is a very invasive procedure done by intensivist stroke anesthetists, and there is a grave concern regarding COVID-19 and ventilation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This is a CT scan. Now, it's slightly different from a chest X-ray, but it is a radiograph. On the left, we can see what appears to be what is a normal CT scan. That again, you see the big white area. It looks like almost like a kidney bean on its side, but in the middle is a rounded or blonde white area. That's the heart, and both sides are the lungs. If we look to the other side, though, we can see a similar picture with the rounded heart, the lungs on either side, but outside the chest wall, we see more air. And this does, is the air that tracks up underneath the skin and causes further distress. This is what is known, as I said, as surgical emphysema. So this patient had, this patient had his chest drains inserted and he resolved. Eventually was able to be discharged from the high dependency unit into the general ward. The chest drains were removed. The patient became ambulatory. And after two negative tests, he was discharged from the hospital. So we have had a very lucky escape and a very positive result. However, just to expand a bit, not all the cases go well. Can I just have the next slide, please? This is a severe case of COVID-19 affecting the lungs. Four pictures, three are the CT scans. And what we're seeing is progressively worsening uh, infiltration into the CT scans. Um, on the upper left to my left is the beginning, and you can see the patchy infiltrates. They're getting worse on the right. And then, in, and then as we come down to the last one on the left, it is severe. This is a pneumonitis stroke pneumonia. And we know now that this causes severe respiratory embarrassment, often requiring ventilation, followed by what is called something we are calling the cytokine storm, which is an overwhelming inflammatory response. And this can often re result in death. So this is where we may have been heading with this patient. I'm delighted to say we did not get that far because of interventions of the entire team globally, and the patient was able to be discharged. But I want to re-emphasize we were lucky, and that to prevent this happening to just about anybody, despite him having risk factors, we know that around the world, other members have no risk factors and for some reason become victims of the same way. So risk factors are not all. And we know that by intervening, we can improve our results, but we do not want to see this. So I appeal again, this can happen, it has happened, it will happen again. This disease is as deadly now around the world and in Trinidad as it was when it first emerged at the end of 2019, it is still and will continue to be a killer. There is no effective treatment. There is no effective vaccine that is proven. We must prevent the infections, wear our masks, and stay at home.
One last slide, just to illustrate some of what we do as surgeons. We wear the protective air wear. We have our surgical mask, which is standard. But then we also use goggles. You can see our lady there wearing the N95 mask. And in some cases, our doctor there is wearing a hood with a flask mask over it as well. Now, some uh, procedures generate a lot of aerosolized in, uh, particles, particularly when we have to put the patients to sleep, that is by intubating them. They cough, it comes out. So our anesthetic colleagues are particular in trying to avoid this, and they wear as much protective gear as possible. And as thoracic surgeons, we also are exposed because we do a procedure called bronchoscopy, where we look into the patient's airway, and they can often cough and are exposed as well. So we are taking our precautions. To date, we have, no, we have not operated on any known case of COVID-19. There are suspicious cases. We take as much precaution as we possibly can. And for now, we have had no healthcare workers directly involved being tested positive. But we know that unfortunately, around the world, the healthcare workers are on the front line and unfortunately, some have died. Therefore, I appeal to you again, wear the masks, stay at home. There is no effective treatment. There is no effective vaccine as such. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. West. <coughs> at this time, Dr. Narish Nandram, Principal Medical Officer, Epidemiology at the Ministry of Health, will now provide us with an update on the process for COVID-19 testing. Thank you, Honourable Ministers, uh, Dr. West, members of the media, and of course, members of our viewing public. Uh, today, I'd like to shed some light on the issue of testing. It's important, very important, in fact, to note that all testing is not the same. Different tests have different degrees of reliability, different degrees of accuracy, and because of that, because of those reasons, uh, only certain tests are recognized by the World Health Organization and recommended by them. And in turn, certain tests are recognized by the Ministry of Health. So I'd just like to quickly, uh, if we could get the first slide up, please. Uh, I'd like to go through a quick compare and contrast on uh, the two major uh, types of tests. There are diagnostic tests and then there's serological tests. So diagnostic tests are the gold standard. These are as good as tests can get. Uh, they are recommended by the World Health Organization and also recognized uh, by the Ministry of Health. These are in comparison to serological tests, which are not currently recommended by the World Health Organization for clinical use. And, and following from that, they are also not recognized at, at the moment by the Ministry of Health. Um, the, if I could have the, the slide back up, please. The, some of the key differentiating features uh, that help us to, to differentiate these tests are the technology uh, that, that the test is based upon. The gold standard test uses molecular technology. That is, it looks for the actual genetic material in the virus, the, the RNA. Uh, you know, and this allows the test to be accurate from the very first day a patient manifests symptoms, up to 10 days after. And this is in comparison to serological tests that, you, that really look for your body's response to infection. Uh, they, they look for the antibodies that your body produce, which usually takes two to three weeks, which means that these serological tests are only accurate two to three weeks after. And even then, there's some reliability issues with, uh, with their results. Um, the sampling type for the gold standard diagnostic test is what we've been using, the uh, nasopharyngeal swab, uh, as opposed to the serological tests, which are blood tests. Um, the, one of the key differentiating things uh, for diagnostic tests is that it requires highly trained staff and a, and a specialized laboratory. Uh, as opposed to minimal training uh, and, you know, these little rapid cartridges. The turnaround time for these tests are also different. The gold standard test takes time. It, uh, the, it, the test takes several hours to complete, 
whereas a rapid test can give a result in a few minutes, but we've already mentioned how unreliable that can be. Now, on the second slide, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about our expansion of uh, testing sites. Uh, now, at the moment, the majority of countries in CARICOM depend on CARFA, the Caribbean Public Health Agency, to, to uh, do their testing. Trinidad and Tobago is looking to wean off uh, that, that sole dependency and collaborate instead with CARFA uh, to establish and expand our own national testing capacity. So, as you'd see on, on this slide, the samples, when they're collected from the public health sector, are usually shunted to Trinidad and Tobago Public Health Lab and, and at the moment, uh, to CARFA. That's going to be uh, sent subsequently to UE's uh, testing site, which is the first site that we have uh, coming online. And later on, we'll be bringing online several other testing sites at North Central RHA, uh, the SWRHA, and the Medical Research Foundation. Uh, all these sites use large capacity machines. They are capable of testing many, many, many uh, samples at, at the same time. The key thing I'd like to highlight on this, uh, on this slide is that where the ministry is making uh, provision to have point of care testing placed into every uh, major hospital and this will be the reliable gold standard molecular based testing style. Um, if we could please move to the, to the, the third slide. I'd just like to quickly uh, put some information as to what is required to, to set up uh, the, uh, a lab to do testing. It requires a lot of technical collaboration and to set up our, our, the ministry's labs, we have been collaborating very, very closely with uh, the University of the West Indies, the Pan American Health Organization, the Caribbean Public Health Agency, and Caribbean Medical Lab Foundation and all these agencies have collaborated uh, with their own technical skill sets uh, to ensure that the tests we do are accurate, they're validated, and that the, the, the quality assurance uh, mechanisms to ensure that when uh, a sample is reported on, it can, it, it can, it's accurate. Uh, the infrastructure to, that goes into uh, uh, establishing these labs is not insignificant. Uh, what is required is a biosafety level two, laboratory space, clean rooms, PCR equipment, biosafety hoods, uh, and a number of other consumables. In addition to that, these labs uh, require highly trained staff. So the ministry has already trained uh, about 82 uh, uh, medical lab technicians and sensitized them to the process, and, and that con training continues in the coming weeks. Um, I hope that, uh, that this update sheds some light and helps the public differentiate between the tests that they can rely on and the tests that perhaps uh, they, they should not put as much stock in. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nandram. Members of the media, the floor is now open. Remember to identify yourself and the media house you represent before posing your question. Know that we want to give as many of you an opportunity to pose questions to us, but that means in our limited time, we will have to give each media house a chance to get a maximum of two questions in. Once we have completed the pool and time allows, I will come back to you. So let us keep this in mind as we begin taking your questions. 98.1. Good morning to the panel. Uh, Stephen Cummings, uh, 98.1 FM. Uh, two questions, uh, one for Dr. West and the other for Minister Dial Singh. Uh, Dr. West, um, how prevalent is acute respiratory disease is in Trinidad and Tobago? And have you noticed any strong linkages to COVID-19? And uh, the Minister of Health, the Minister Dial Singh, there's been a recalibration in the country's national budget deficit forecast for 2020, and I believe up from 5.3 billion to 15 billion dollars, all brought about um, 
in this uh, COVID-19 period. Based on the huge investment being made in healthcare with the now creation of a parallel healthcare system as a response to COVID-19, and maybe future pandemics, um, do you, uh, what, would, what would you um, say in terms of um, the sustainability of this uh, parallel healthcare system going forward um, post COVID-19? Are we able as a country to sustain um, such a system? Sure. So I will go, I will take the second question first and then uh, Mr. Mark will go next. So after, once COVID started, you may recall that I took a note to cabinet maybe over a month or five or six weeks ago, where cabinet at that time approved $157 million for the four RHAs in Trinidad to deal with COVID, and an additional $50 million was allocated to the TRHA. I must say that the priority set by the Honorable Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance clearly demonstrates that once any reasonable request for funding is made for the parallel healthcare system, they will be fulfilled. And I have the absolute faith and confidence in the Minister of Finance, who was a former Minister of Health. So, so far, we have gotten everything we have asked for. And that last cabinet note also gives me the authority to come back to cabinet in case we need more funding to prepare for the second and third wave. So I see no, um, no financial challenges moving forward dealing with COVID. Thank you. Dr. West. Mr. Cummings, uh, good to see you again. Thank you very much for the question. The question relates to acute respiratory distress and its prevalence in Trinidad and Tobago. I'd like to preface the answer by stating that the most common respiratory problem we have in Tobago is actually chronic disease and that we should never forget that that is the main driver of respiratory distress in Trinidad and Tobago. The main two are asthma, COPD, we have lung cancer, TB, and interstitial and lung disease and fibrosis. Acute respiratory distress can occur in asthmatics or in exacerbations of COPD or in infections such as pneumonia, which unfortunately some of our COVID patients may get and this is how it generally presents as well as pulmonary embolus thus in the overall spectrum of acute of respiratory disease acute respiratory disorder is not that prevalent at the moment in Trinidad and Tobago save for those some of those patients who may present with CO, with uh, sorry with covid as well as other potential viral illnesses such as influenza although well, fortunately we're not in the influenza season just now per se but that again changes on a month-to-month -month basis. Thank you, Dr. West. New source. Hi, good morning. Morning, Hi. Rhoda. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, Rhoda Barrett here. Uh, this is, I think, for Minister Dayal Singh. Sure. Now, I know there's been a lot of focus thus far on whether or not Carnival has had any sort of impact on COVID, on the COVID virus here, but I was wondering with respect to the community sampling, um, the voluntary community sampling that the ministry and, and, and health officials are embarking on, if the 19,000 returnees, the persons that would have returned on or around the week that ended March 22nd, 23rd thereabouts, if they are going to be targeted as part of that sample base um, because they were recently traveled. Okay, so let me take the question. The CMO would have indicated, and you just heard Dr. West, there has been no increase in acute respiratory illness in Trinidad and Tobago. None. And the CMO dealt with this um, effectively over two or three weeks ago. Carnival had no impact on COVID. Three, random sampling is just that, random. We are not going to target the uh, group of people who came in before the borders were closed. The random sampling means we are going into the community, as the CMO has said, and maybe the doctors can explain, we are not targeting asymptomatic persons. We have expanded the case definition outside of recent travel history, contact with a, a COVID positive person, secondary contacts, 
to now include anyone presenting with viral illness, fever, cough, so on, that is the group of people who will be targeted for random sampling. It makes no sense to randomly sample well asymptomatic people. You will get a negative result and you will waste scarce resources. I don't know, the do I don't know if Dr. Nandram wants to add to that. Contradict support. <laughs> Uh, I, th I think you hit the nail on the head there, Minister. Uh, for for the for proper uh, evaluation to be done, random sampling must uh, be uh, be allowed uh, as, as the sampling method. And what we what we'd like to do is we'd like to take a random sample of symptomatic persons. Right. And as Minister uh, rightfully pointed out, we're expanding beyond Coffer's initial uh, definition uh, of of, uh, of of COVID cases. We don't we. Whether or not you have a travel history doesn't matter to us. Uh, whether or not you were in contact with someone that that was that ha, uh, had a confirmed case of COVID doesn't matter. As long as you have a fever and symptoms, we're, we're willing to test. Uh, as long as as those requirements are met, they they can be uh, incorporated into our random sample. And let me just make the point um, because I think it's an important point to make that was made yesterday. We are now going to go into the homes for the aged. Um, because y if you look globally, one of the major um, sources of fatality numbers are homes for the age worldwide. We want to deepen our relationship with the homes, and we will be going into the homes um, to scan our residents there. Once they fit this expanded case definition, that is, they have a fever, a cough, or whatever, we are going to be randomly sampling um, our age persons in these homes to make sure they are kept as safe as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. TV6. Hi, good morning, everyone. Nicholas Sushman Singh here from morning, TV6. Nicholas. I good have, morning. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, I have two questions for Dr. West. Uh, could we tell from x rays if a person suffered and survived COVID 19 affirmatively? How sound is that science? And and seeing that we did not have a confirmed case until March 12th, is it possible to look at an X-ray? If on file of a person who died or survived some respiratory crisis in the months prior to the outbreak and be able to say whether they had COVID-19 or not? Dr. West. Okay, well, thank you very much for the question. The question pertains to the imaging diagnosis of COVID-19 either at the time or in the past. Right. Medical science has been assiduously trying to be able to diagnose COVID-19 as quickly as possible. And radiological imaging, as shown by my presentation, does have clear evidence of COVID infections at times. And it has been utilized in some areas to try and use mainly CT scanning as opposed to chest X-ray to try and elucidate. What this shows is um, infection and inflammation, but does not prove at all that a person has COVID-19. The proof you've heard uh, Dr. Nandra explain has to be done by that type of testing. So you cannot prove what 100% certainty where that a person has had COVID in now or in the past by a radiograph, CT or chest X-ray. It must be done by the testing that Dr. Nandra has had. If you look at x-rays in the front, look back and you may see somebody who's had lung disease with scarring, fibrosis. That will give an indication that something unfortunate has happened. Uh, but again, you cannot prove with 100% certainty unless you do the testing. So some countries have started looking at CD scans as an indicator of COVID-19 because the turnaround has been faster, it's almost instantaneous for CT scanning. However, those patients and any other patients cannot be proven and therefore has to undergo a secondary test, which can do so as Dr. Nandra has explained. Thank you. We move to Prior. Hi, good morning, Prior Barry, easybnews.com. Dr. Nandra, the testing site at UE, can you tell me the number of people who, who would man that and, and would they be working um, um, on a 24 hours basis? And 
and Dr. West, you said that there were grave concern concerning the, 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 the ventilation of COVID-19 patients. Can you tell us what are those concerns? Dr. Nandra. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the question, Mr. Pryor. Uh, with regard to, to UWE, at, at the moment, we have approximately eight uh, staff there, and they're not yet operating on a 24-hour basis. Uh, they're operating in two shifts at, at the moment. The, the morning team does the, uh, the extraction, and the, and the afternoon team uh, does the amplification and, and quantification. Okay. I hope that answers. Okay, thank you. Yep. Dr. West? Ah, good morning. Thank you very much for the question. It pertains to ventilation in COVID patients. Ventilation is a term used, um, invasive ventilation, I should be more specific, is a term used by which a tube is passed in through the airway and attached to a machine called a ventilator, passing air into the patient's lungs. Specialists called anesthetists and intensivists look after this, and they are highly trained. These patients who present and who require invasive or even non-invasive, but let's be more specific, invasive ventilation are very sick and they are not managing to keep as much oxygen in their system and they probably will succumb if acute uh, intervention is not done. When the air goes into the uh, lungs, it does help by providing oxygen, but at other times it can also cause increased damage. Now, Patients with COVID-19, the numbers that we are seeing suggest that around 80% of patients who go onto a ventilator with COVID-19 pneumonia do not survive. This is because primary of two reasons. One, the lungs are already terribly damaged by the time they are needing the ventilator and cannot recover. And two, this term that I have mentioned, which is becoming more prevalent, so-called cytokine st storm, which is an overwhelming inflammatory response driven by the body's reaction to COVID-19. So, in summary, ventilation is something which is necessary, but only as a last resort in COVID-19. We are seeing some uh, cases around the world where we are accepting very low oxygen levels, around 80%, as opposed to normally patients would be intubated, a tube pass, when you're down to 90% or just below that. Some people have gone as low as 50%. This, this is something we have not seen. 50% saturations and still carrying on conversations, using their phones, is quite remarkable. It's part of the pathology of COVID. We don't have all the answers. But we do know that if we do ventilate patients, there's a very high chance they will not survive. CNC3? Hi, good morning, everyone. Chester Sambrano, Garden Media. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Two questions from Minister Yal Singh. Sure. Um, the, the four healthcare workers in Napa and the two I've expected next week, is it because they are suspected? Can you clarify that? And in terms of the Registered Nurses Association, they called for hazard pay, debt benefits, and health insurance for nurses. Has there been any discussion around that? Sure. So, as I said, Napa is being used for healthcare workers who have completed their tour of duty. They are not COVID positive. Remember, the healthcare workers in these facilities live with the patients. To protect them and their families, they are given a two week cool off period in Napa or their other facilities that each RHA has. That is simply to protect the families of healthcare workers. And this is where I really want to thank healthcare workers again, because they volunteer to stay with these patients, whether it's Brooklyn, Takarigua, home of football, they volunteer to live with them. And then after their tour duty is done, they go into voluntary quarantine. And this happens across the world. On the issue with the nurses, all RHAs, and I cleared that this morning, I met with the CEOs of all RHAs, have some sort of insurance for healthcare workers, healthcare workers in general, not a particular group. However, I am told um, they are looking to go to the chief personnel officer to see what other additional coverage can be offered, but this has to be done uh, using the process available with the chief personnel officer. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. 
TTT. TTT Limited. Uh, my question is for Dr. West. Going back to your presentation about the effects of COVID-19 on the lungs of this particular patient, can you perhaps share with us what's the quality of life one is able to lead mm. post-discharge? Nice. Okay. Good morning, TTT. Thank you for the question. It relates to the quality of life post-discharge. And so, um, I would have to say a lot of it depends on what the quality of life was pre COVID. <laughs> so this patient uh, had hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease. Wow. Unfortunately, the word we use is comorbidity or associated illness. This patient would have had a significant amount of um, comorbidity associated with it. Um, if we take a patient who does not have as much comorbidity, and we're seeing this unfortunately, patients with no risk factors, young patients, 19, 15, 20 year old people, no risk factors, and getting COVID, these people have, by and large, if they recover, have lead a moderate quality of life, but we do not have the data to determine what their long-term quality of life is because it has not been along, around long enough. We have not studied them and done all the imaging and measured their lung functions and all the other aspects. I would also like to say that some of these patients, the younger ones in particular, aside from lung disease, have been presented with strokes. COVID is a multifactorial disease affecting primarily the respiratory system, but also just about every other system, including the hematological blood system causing thickening and patients are presenting with strokes. So coming back to my, my plea, wear the masks, stay at home, reduce the COVID reliance. The country on the whole has been very lucky and has done very well, but there is a risk possibly due to uh, relaxing of uh, the patient's vigilance that we may see it rise. So if we must maintain our vigilance. Thank you. Newsday. Good morning, Khalifa Klein from the Newsday. Can you hear me? Yes, Yes. good morning. Clearly. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to ask about the asymptomatic patients. You said that the diagnostic test would not be used on patients who are asymptomatic because it would show off negative. But international data says that a significant percentage of the people who do contract COVID-19 are going to be asymptomatic. So how does that factor in terms of the surveillance to find out exactly how many people in the country would have the disease? And is there a um, I, I know the serology test you said is not being used now, but is there any, any consideration to use it alongside the diagnostic tests in future? Dr. Nandra? Thank you for your question. Uh, I'll, I'll take the first bit first. With regard to asymptomatic patients, when doing a random sample of 1.4 million people, how do we identify the people that have COVID but are asymptomatic? The short answer is we can't unless we test them. And the only way to do that is to test everyone. Uh, that's why identifying globally the proportion of people that, that are asymptomatic but have COVID is exceedingly difficult uh, to, to establish. Given our, our limited resource base and the pressing need uh, for us to establish this quickly, uh, the ideal scenario for us would be to test persons that have symptoms because they're the ones that will more likely manifest uh, and they're much more easily identified in the population. So that, that's why the targeting methodology is the way it is and why globally testing asymptomatic persons is, is not something that can be done on a large scale. Uh, with regard to the serological testing, uh, the serological testing is not recommended by the World Health Organization uh, for, for the clinical clinical settings at this point in time. Uh, there, so its use in, in the clinical setting is possible in future as long as the technology for serological testing improves and once it meets with recommendations from rec recognized bodies like the World Health Organization and such. Uh, as long as the technology improves and it's, and it's recommended as, as best practice, of course we, you know, we will definitely look into integrating that at that time. Uh, until then, the technology remains too unreliable for routine use. I, I hope that answers your question. Astronaut Health News. 
Leonard Stewart, Astronaut Health Newspaper. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Just want to say thank you to Dr. West for uh, graphically reopening our eyes to the laboratory situation of that we're in right now. And Dr. Nandrum, thank you for reassuring us that Trinidad and Tobago is upholding to the high standards of excellence in testing. And my question to you is, how soon do we expect point of care testing to come on stream at our major hospitals? And to Dr. Minister Dial Singh, uh, what structure will we be using for random test uh, sampling? When I say what structure, I mean, are we going to be providing uh, like listings of the areas where the mobile, the testing will be taking place? Okay, Let's see I maybe okay Wednesday. so i will take i will take the last part first and then i'll go across to dr nandram the surveillance testing as we outlined one health center uh we are choosing a health center with high traffic in each of the counties i think there are what nine counties eight eight, eight uh, counties we have already started that process so it's 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 scattered throughout what we call the primary health care si system we choose the health center with a lot of traffic and the random sampling will be done there. That is, we look at people who present with fevers, any other signs of um, respiratory distress, and we randomly sample those at the health center. So that's the structure. And also we marry that with going in now to the homes for the aged. We want to make sure that we keep our elderly population as safe as humanly possible. And now Dr. Nandram could take over. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, with regard to your question about the point of care testing at hospitals, uh, that's currently being uh, uh, pursued by our procurement unit. Uh, at this point in time, I don't have a definitive date to share, but as soon as we do, uh, we, we will bring that to the public's attention. But the procurement unit is, is currently in, engaged in that process. I, I Guardian that Media question. Limited. Hi, good morning. Um, morning. Lisa Christopher morning. from Guardian Media. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Um, Dr. West, you touched on the, and the Minister of Health himself touched on the uh, cases appearing in young people where they're developing blood clots and such. Um, I just wanted to find out that if that information in any way has affected the adjustment of policy or treatment for those such patients. And also, with regard to testing, I, I read an article recently that some some countries have started testing wastewater to see if there are there are instances of coronavirus in specific communities. Is that an avenue that we would be looking at in Trinidad? And how would that be implemented if it were to be used? Not yet. Do you answer? So we'll have Dr. West take his part of the question, and then Dr. Nandram will take his part of the question. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Christopher. Thank you very much for the question. So the incidence of uh, strokes in, or prevalence of strokes with COVID is not known, unfortunately. What is known is that we have patients at all ages uh, presenting with um, the strokes and blood clots. This is uh, unusual for young people. It does happen in older people for many other reasons. We can get into that later. So when we are seeing this now, we realize that the COVID-19 and the pathogen is, and the virus is reacting in some ways to, 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 the, to create the high viscous blood and blood clots within the brain and to the blood flow to the brain. Unfortunately, these patients usually present that way and we don't have a prodromal of these patients. So when they present like that, then they are treated. If they are lucky, they may survive. If not, they will die. We have not yet instituted, nor is it yet common medical practice, prophylactic treatment against strokes and blood clots for patients who have got COVID. It is not yet widespread. And we, as far as I know, in Trinidad are not doing that. We are mainly supportive care. We have started a few patients on antibiotics and some patients on steroids to reduce this inflammatory response I talk about. But in terms of the treatment or the prophylactic or preventative treatment for strokes, 
it is not yet part of the uh, accepted regimen for COVID-19 treatment in Trinidad and Tobago. It may be, it's, we don't have these, what we call randomized trials to show clear benefit for these things. Therefore, you could actually be doing some more harm. So it is very much a case by case basis. And on that basis, we in Trinidad yet have not judged that it is the right way to go. We are, we are very cautious in medicine, in Trinidad and Tobago in particular, not wanting to cause any harm. Be well, before we go to Dr. Nandram, from a policy perspective, this is why the government and the Prime Minister is choosing a very careful path. There have been calls to reopen the country, flick a switch. You can't do that. Angela Merkel in Germany is trying to do that, and she is saying they are skating on very thin ice. The point coming out of Dr. Uh, West's presentation is that your government has been steering a very careful path. This new development with strokes in young persons should alert us to the fact that we need to be much more careful and the exhortations to stay home as far as humanly possible and wear masks is what will save lives. So I'm hoping that having Dr. West here this morning reinforces in the public's mind that what Trinidad and Tobago is doing is correct by the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Nandram. Thank you so much, Minister. Uh, Mr. Christopher, thank you so much for, for your question. Uh, it pertained to uh, the testing of wastewater and whether or not uh, we would be pursuing uh, that line of testing. Uh, the testing of sewer water has not been established as best practice. It's not something that's actually commonly done. And at this point in time, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, we can do a lot better than testing sewer water. We can test the persons. Uh, testing sewer water will only tell you that somewhere along the line, uh, someone that contributed to that sewer water may have had coronavirus. Uh, but testing a person will tell you whether that individual does or does not. And that's, that's, that's mm. where we're aiming for. I trust that answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Nand Dr. Nandram. I think we have, um, I recognize Yolan Thomas. And lifestyle communications. Yes, morning. Uh, morning. morning. Minister Dion Singh, this yes. question is for you. Sure. I have one for you, Dr. Nandram. Uh, with regards to a recent study in the U.S. Virginia University, it stated that uh, 368 patients, 97 who took the hydroxychloroquine, there was a 27.8 death rate. Mm -hmm. And the others who did not take it, there was an 11.4% death rate. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to find out from you if persons have been returning the drug given the fact that it's for malaria patients, as well as persons who are taking it for lupus. Thank you. And Dr. Dr. Nanda, can you state the 82 persons if they have been dispersed the labs thus far? Okay, so I will go with the first part. Trinidad and Tobago, again, steered a very careful path since the um, grabbing on to hydroxychloroquine uh, was aired about a month and a half ago. We stayed away from that because we knew that unless you have trials, blind trials or double blind trials, to prove both the effectiveness and safety of a drug, we were not going to expose patients to that and expose our doctors and nurses to criminal and civil liability. I raised that here already. Luckily, Trinidad and Tobago did not join that bandwagon, even though persons who sit opposite us in the parliament are on the public record as recommending hydroxychloroquine. We will be led by the science and we will not endanger the lives of our patients. There was another study in France and 11 persons died taking hydroxychloroquine. Dr. West and Dr. Nandram can tell you when hydroxychloroquine is used in COVID 
positive patients, it leads to heart arrhythmias, it leads to all sorts of cardiac problems. So I don't know if the two goodly doctors would like to give you some more technical details on why hydroxychloroquine is not to be used, whether they have been returned to the pharmacies. Um, you will have to speak to Mr. Um, Andrew Rahman, the president of the Pharmacy Association. He may have information on that. Thank you. Doctors? Uh, with regard to the use of hydroxychloroquine, uh, it's been put into the public domain uh, by a lot of media houses and, and even the U.S. President, uh, Donald Trump. The science simply is not there. Um, it does, the science does not at this time support the use of hydroxychloroquine uh, uh, for treatment of COVID-19. And studies, like you so rightfully cited, highlight the fact that it, it you know, increases the... Uh, the rate at which COVID-19 patients develop uh, other issues and, 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 and in so doing, uh, apart from cardiac arrhythmias and, and some other issues, uh, it decreases uh, the, the rate of survival in the groups that are taking the drug. So unlike what a drug should be doing, hydroxychloroquine does not help uh, uh, according to the science. It doesn't help COVID-19 patients, it hurts them. So it's not recommended for use at this point in time. Dr. West, is there anything you wish to add? Yes, thanks very much. Um, thanks for the question. And as relates to hydroxychloroquine in particular, it highlights the correct and incorrect way we need to move forward with medication. The correct way is by proven drugs which have minimal side effects and complications. Um, hydroxychloroquine was touted by a number of small studies having miraculous cures, cures, and because of the panic that was going on, it was picked up by various media houses and people and bandied around the place. And at the initial stages, there was widespread panic, and people bought into it, took it, and then, as you've heard, it causes complications related to the heart and arrhythmias, and some people have had very adverse uh, outcomes. It also highlights the way we must manage this problem we have. We must use our brains. In other words, we use the information that is presented to us, we rationalize it, and we act upon it. So COVID-19 is a very complex disease. Many, many treatments have been tried. None have been proven by the established route of double-blind, randomized controlled trials. There are drugs still being tried, but it has not been proven. And therefore, it should not be used. For example, unfortunately, there was a drug called remdesivir. It's an antiviral. Early testing showed that it was promising. Further testing showed it was not successful. It needs the full panacea of proper testing across multiple sites to establish that. And until we have that information, we should be very cautious. In fact, should not use drugs which people fly by on the internet or, run or, or just mention or any other source from them saying that a particular drug is the miracle cure. It's a very dangerous disease, very difficult to treat, no vaccines. Let's be very clear what we're dealing with here. There's nothing there to treat it, but yet we need to wear our masks and stay at home. Yes, we should be looking out, but as far as acting to take medication like hydroxychloroquine or just about anything else, we should withhold from that. Thank you very just, much. Just before we close off on that topic, as, a, as somebody responsible for making policy, we will be guided by WHO. Just to let you know, WHO has launched something called a Solidarity Project. What that project is doing is doing clinical trials under very controlled situations to determine what combination of drug and or drugs could be used to treat COVID-19. The program is ongoing. At this time, there are no firm results from that WHO Solidarity Project to say we can use drug A, drug B, or drug C. Until we get to that stage, as the doctors will tell you, we have to use supportive care, but at the end of the day, stay home, wear a mask, so you don't end up in a hospital. Thank you, Minister. Loop Titi. Hi, good morning, everyone. Nico Pasna. Morning, Nico. Good morning. Uh, 
Dr. Nanshan, forgive me if it was mentioned, but I had some audio issues, so I'm asking just to be certain. Do we know when the testing sites that you've mentioned will come on stream? Do we have a timeline for any of them? Um, what I can say is that the, uh, the our testing site in collaboration with UE, uh, the equipment's already there. We're in the final stage of, of verification. I uh, think that that hopefully should be completed by today. Uh, the other labs will come online subsequently. Um, I can't commit to a timeline on that just yet. As soon as that information is, as soon as we, we establish uh, the definitive date, we will release that information. What I, what I can add, um, the next lab that we are looking to get on stream will be in Southwest Regional Health Authority, where we have placed a brand new machine. It's an Abbott machine. The key back was that there was a trade embargo. We could not get the test kits out of the United States because there's a, there was an embargo. I am happy to report that we will be receiving 4,000 uh, test kits that will go to Southwest, but I can't give you a firm time. Um, the embargo on that particular company has been partially lifted. I spoke to the agent uh, two days ago, and as soon as we get those 4,000 test kits, they will be dedicated to Southwest. And then we also want to give Tobago their own capacity to do point of care testing. So that's how we want to roll it out. It could be Tobago first. It depends on logistics at this point in time. Bearing in mind, we are dealing with a global pandemic and international supply chains have been terribly disrupted. Express. Good morning, Camille Hunt, Express. Good morning, Camille. Good morning. Can you um, my question is, um, have any surgeries had to be postponed because of diversion of resources to COVID-19? And if so, can you say how many and what type of surgeries these were? Okay, so that's a question for me. At the start of the, global, of, of the pandemic, it is common practice across countries and across healthcare systems, whether you have a natural disaster, an impending storm, that you postpone non-elective urgent surgeries. We took that decision about a month ago, and I can tell you just this morning again, because I have my meeting quarter to um, nine every morning, we took a decision this morning to restart elective surgeries. It will depend on us getting in. We have a massive shipment of PPE coming in, once the flight gets in, international supply chains have been disrupted. It is there waiting to get onto our cargo flight. Once it gets in, we intend to ring fence a certain amount of PPE because now the anesthetists, the surgeons, the nurses have to have full PPE to restart elective surgeries. However, emergency surgeries were never stopped. So I hope that answers your question. 95.5. Good morning to everyone with Field Journal from N95.5. As you mentioned, Tobago a while ago, uh, Mr. Dial Singh, just for confirmation, there was some lab equipment that was promised to be sent to Tobago last week. Are you in a position to confirm that it is in fact an island? Sure. And uh, do you have the number of persons, a figure for the number of persons from Tobago who would have received the training mentioned earlier? Okay. So at the meeting this morning, we have confirmed that somebody from Tobago is going to be flying in over the next one or two days to take possession of the four ventilators. I cleared that with um, Dr. Parkinson. He is in charge of that project. So it should be in Tobago, today's what, Tuesday, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, so somebody from Tobago is coming across here, I think to do, probably to do some initial training and take possession of those ve four ventilators to go across to Tobago. As the exact numbers, sir, I wouldn't have that level of detail on me at this particular point in time. Okay, we move back to 98.1, one question. Good morning again, uh, Stephen Cummings, uh, 98.1 FM. 
A question for Dr. Nandram. Uh, from positive samples tested so far as of today, um, Tuesday, 28th April, um, I see we are running at an average of a little over 50% patient discharge rate. And when you look at 116 positive tests and 59 hospital discharges, from your clinical observation, Dr. Nandram, does this mean, uh, in your opinion, that we have stabilized based on trending patient uh, stats that we have seen over the, the, um, the very many days? Uh, the, to predict, uh, you know, is, 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 is difficult, but uh, given, given the, the low numbers of positive cases we've seen in the last couple of days, I'd say that that we're doing some of the right things. Uh, this can the the situation can change at any time depending on on how people behave. Uh, so to say that things are stable and everything's fine would would be ill-advised. Uh, you know, what we can say is in the past couple of days things have been going relatively well, and and that's the that that's about you know the the most hmm. I, I'm, I'm able to comment. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nandram. Final question, TV6. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hello? Good morning. Good morning. Right, so my question is for the Health Minister. Yes. Um, we know the work on the central block at the Port of Spain Hospital was scheduled for construction last year. How much of a priority is this going to be post-COVID-19? Okay. That's it? Yeah. So when we passed the first set of regulations, which basically shut down construction throughout the country. We made two exceptions. One, the interchange at the QREP roundabout. You will notice that has gone on because it's a national infrastructure project. And we said all hospital construction would go on. So Central Block never stopped. It's a priority, has been, and the work on Central Block has never stopped. And I think post-COVID, you will need central block now even more than you needed, needed it before. So, short answer, work never stopped. It went on as per usual. Thank you very much. Doctors, minister, members of the media, we have come to the end of today's virtual media conference. Do remember that the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Communications are your only credible sources of government information on COVID-19. We wanted to let you know that while you're at home, the National Library and Information Systems Authority, NALIS, has identified a fantastic resource to keep your minds sharp and give parents and guardians a much needed break during this COVID-19. The internationally known Rosetta Stone is offering free access to its resources to learn a foreign language. This offer is available to all students and can be assessed at www.rosettastone.com slash free for students. For information on other resources, please check the NALIS website at www.nalis.gov.tt. I am Donna Cox, Minister of Communications. Thank you for joining us today as the government continues its efforts to flatten the curve and beat COVID-19. Stay home. Stay safe. May God bless Trinidad and Tobago. And that was an update on the COVID-19 pandemic from the Ministry of Health. Just a quick review of some of the key points we just heard. Lastly, from Minister Donna Cox, I am looking forward to trying to access Rosetta Stone. That's www.rosettastone.com slash free for students. In addition to that, sadly, we have gotten to the 3 millionth mark in terms of positive cases globally. Locally, 116 positive cases, 59 discharges, and the number of deaths has not changed at eight. Uh, Dr. Mark West speaking to chest surgical manifestations of COVID-19, as well as Dr. Naresh Nandram updating on the process for COVID-19 testing. They actually brought slides and showed us some of the gravity of the situation and once again warned against becoming complacent in the fight against this COVID-19 pandemic. The main driver of respiratory-related issues in Trinidad and Tobago remains chronic illnesses such as asthma, tuberculosis, lung cancer, etc. Uh, Tobago should have four more ventilators by the week's end. With that said, though, you do not want to be placed on a ventilator. Part of the issue is that to be placed on a ventilator, most likely you would have had the COVID-19 virus presenting for a while, 
giving, giving it the opportunity to spread unchecked in your system. Now, there is still a great deal unknown about COVID-19, but there are other phenomena being observed post -res or past respiratory issues. But do not believe the hype with every miracle cure that is touted because science is disproving it at some point or the other. But stay tuned, we will have more of the issues as they were presented today in subsequent newscasts. We are being reminded that we must stay home and stay safe and save lives. I'm DK Rasta. Stay with us here on TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, Sweet 100.1 FM, Next 99.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online for the latest COVID-19 news. My name is Mandela.